Orion is going to be uh, our first presenter. Yeah, but uh, real quick, thanks for everybody coming out. There's a few new members or a few uh, new people to the group. I don't know. Would you mind standing up? You don't have to. Um, tell us uh, maybe what you're growing and who you are. And um, yeah. did you want to introduce yourself? Are you okay with that? Yeah, sure. Um, you here, yeah, yeah, you're fine. If you want to stand up here, you're okay too. Whatever. I'm Charles Hart. I've been living my life scanning these prints, and um, I, uh, I'm an entomologist, but I grow a lot of fruits at home and grow a little bit of everything. We can do things and how to manage the Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say Mara Mesa or La Mesa? La Mesa. La Mesa. And you're fairly close to me, probably. I'm in Custody or I can throw a rock and get La Mesa two different directions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Welcome. Um, yeah. In North Pacific Beach, it's been a few years since we've been here. Uh, I made a mistake some years ago, and I planted like seven different types of bananas. <laughs> and, uh, then I realized that you got to keep up with bananas, and but then I planted other things. And I sort of round out the bananas. So I have <laughs> we have white sapote. A um, couple different really good um, academia nut trees. Mm. Um, Chipotle cava. Yeah. Wow, we we said to our we have two Chipotle cavas, and we said either have fruit, we're going to pull you out, and then fruit on both trees. Is that right? <laughs> It's like a really hard grape, but um, with, um, it's, with the crunchy seed and stuff. Like it's really, really it's, like yeah. it's like a grape and a and a um, light yeah. yeah. So we have um, some beach you can get them. Um, Longan, um, oh, lots of yeah, cher and cherimoya, um, uh, cherimoya and the. The white sapote, we can't stop it from falling. Like ice cream. Oh. Um, scoop it out without the seed. Scoop it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're planning more stuff. We got some anything that is struggling with the discount. So the trees kind of fall when they're small. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's great. Sounds like you're doing well. Keep it up. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Um, did you want? My name is Kisari. I'm from Japan. Um, my husband and baby, they just left. They need to see that. Thank you, Kisari. Thank you, Kisari. Thank you, Kisari. Like five years ago, we got to go. 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 But to get them there, they come up, there's a trick. They're just water. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming. Okay, so yeah, we got mango seeds out there. We said it once before. The fruit tasting, we got a pretty good sized fruit tasting. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Ken. Oh, yeah. I got so listen, I'm Kevin. I'm one of Dave's. He used to come to our meetings a long time ago. Oh, for all the COVID stuff. Yeah. So I'm interested in um, 
some of the more exotic things like onions well, grown with maybe lemons and mellow, lemon spices. Oh. Uh, but also, especially something I was really surprised to see today, and I'm also interested in uh, learning about carrot trees and seeing that some of uh, you got some seeds. Pretty interesting to me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, real quick, we got one more, but Bill has just been uh, volunteered to be our vice chair. So, we Bill's going to be our vice chair, too. Thanks, <laughs> Very good. And thanks for joining the board too, William. Yep. So, no. You're not new. I always forget your name. It comes out. I know you just uh, donated some uh, jackfruit trees that are like this, this tall, beautiful trees. And also mangoes. You got some really nice mangoes you brought in to Bancroft. So yeah, I really appreciate that. We do have our sale coming up um, October 15th. So this Saturday is going to be a work day. We're going to get the whole place cleaned up, sparkling, getting ready for all the people to come in and uh, uh, check out what plants we have for sale, move things around. We need to price. So if you have time Saturday uh, down at Bancroft Spring Valley, 3845 Spring Drive. Um, come on down, enjoy the fun. It's always nice being with the members and get ready for the plant sale. Um, what else we got going? Um, El Cajon, um, the uh, oh, garden. Yeah. Uh, so the water conservation garden is going to have a, a carnival festival. And last year we had a booth and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people showed up. It's nice to walk through all the other booths too. I know Monica and Patrick are there with their Geranium Society booth. Um, besides, uh, I just learned, Monica does the Iris, Geranium, and about four others, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's a really nice place over there. A lot of people show up and it's nice to talk about their fruit. You just see their face lights up. And it's like, oh, my, uh, my banana trees, my apple tree, whatever it is, people get happy talking about it. So um, Do you know what yeah. It's November 5th, 6th, something like that. Yeah, we need somebody to head up the, the booth again. Dave took care of the booth over at the Kale Festival. I was the only one, I had help. Yeah, yeah, Barbara was there. Yeah. And then Gloria Berry, I believe. Yeah, so. And some of the plants that are over on the end there, that are the starch and things that we had that didn't uh, go at the uh, uh, there's low plots and uh, ice cream bean and also some passiflora frederick, a passiflora and to that. Um, um, okay, so that's on the rest of the table. Yep. When is, when is the next, um, um, it'll be November 5th or 6th, I believe. Oh, well, yeah. well, the 15th, October 15th is the plant sale. Oh, the October 15th is the plant sale, but Cuyamaca Gardens are. The water conservation gardens. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. I've been at that one a couple, three times over the years. It's called the Cleomacca College. Uh, it's a good, good little place. Yeah. Okay. So we better get going or else the Zoom people get mad at us. We can't have all the fun. Um, Ariana, I got it right? Yeah. It's a special speaker. Romero's going to be a little bit late. We are going to talk coffee. Yeah, but not right now. Ariana is going to start us off. She's going to get the crowd warmed up, I guess. Okay.
<laughs> all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll mute myself. Well, that's all right. Go ahead. I'll, I'll say something when Ramiro comes Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so, yeah, my name is Ariana. I work with the University of California, just like Ramiro, with agriculture and natural resources. Um, I'm the community education specialist for the um, small farms program here in San Diego. And um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about food safety. Um, we have a food safety technical assistance program. Um, so a little bit of background about myself. You guys actually remind me a lot about the group I used to work with. I used to work in Santa Clara County with a group of master composters. We had composters, gardeners, beekeepers, and I would kind of coordinate those meetings. Oh, I'm not sure why it's not switching on here for you guys. Let me see if I change the slide on here, maybe. Seems like the slides are stuck. There we go. Oh, yeah, they're a little bit behind. Okay. Yeah, so I um so I went to San Jose State University and I graduated with a bachelor's of science in environmental studies um, with a minor in conservation and resource management. And like I said, I was a, uh, doing a compost education program with like a group of about 40 to 50 volunteers who do compost education. Yeah, sorry, I know, I have a soft voice. I'm not used to, I haven't done a presentation in a while. Um, but yeah, so we have beekeepers, composters, gardeners. You guys really remind me a lot about the group that I used to work with. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today with you all. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about our food safety technical assistance program. And I have a fun activity at the end of my presentation for you all as well, just to keep it a little bit more interactive. Um, so right now there are four regional food safety teams in four different regions of California under our extension office. Um, and each team has a few CESs like myself with an advisor like Ramiro who works with a USDA a food safety specialist and her name is Erin DiCaprio and she's really great. Um, and together we are realizing that California has 70,000 farms or growers in California. And we only have three inspectors right now on the uh, CDFA list. So there's a high demand for people like myself to do education and outreach and kind of help prep these growers for when inspectors come. So we are not inspectors ourselves. We just wanna help give resources and prepare these growers for when inspectors do come, if you guys are selling more than $25,000 annually, then you are subject to inspection if you have one of the produces listed on their website. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of challenges right now with only three inspectors. A lot of them are primarily English-based. A lot of our growers are um, Spanish-speaking or of a minority group, Asian growers. And so it's kind of, we, we're facing some barriers. So with that, they've kind of reached out to Extension and said, hey, it would be really helpful if you guys would kind of come on board, help us, you know, be that bridge to this gap that we're having. So right now our goal for the Food Safety Technical Assistance Program is to provide food safety assistance in each region to growers, as well as help them meet the regulatory compliances with Food Safety Modernization Act. So that's why we're here. So a lot of you might be small growers or you know, in the future, you might want to start selling uh, to, you know, marketing and to grocery stores and um, farmers markets. So this is something you might want to pay attention to if you reach over the $25,000 um, annually limit. Um, so just a really quick um, thing that I found once the slide, there we go. Um, so this is an affordable hand washing station. So there are certain requirements when you when you start running your, your grower business and your farm that you're gonna face with OSHA. One of them is that OSHA requires one toilet and one hand washing facility for every 20 workers you have within a quarter mile of the working area. So this is something that um, is we found has been really helpful. It's kind of like a, a cooler and you can put like soap and, and um, you can just put your hose and your water in there and then wash your hands. 
and you're good to go. And if you have that within the quarter mile of the working area, then you will meet compliance. So there's a lot of fun ways that we're trying to provide to growers. Um, right now we're working on some clipboards and we have like, um, so certain growers have to write out uh, information on trainings and keep records. So right now we're kind of building those clipboards, giving them to growers and helping them um, just, you know, providing them with success so that way when the uh, people do come to do inspections, they're, they're ready to go. Um, so if you are interested, again, my name is Ariana. I work with Ramiro Cooperative Extension. If this is something that you might be interested in the future, it's also just really important. And we're going to do a fun activity right now just to see how important food safety is. Um, even just like yourselves, you know, you guys grow food, you bring it here, you share with each other a lot like people who I used to work with as well, it's important to make sure that we're being safe with our food, we're being clean, we're being uh, sanitary. So I have a glow germ activity. I don't know if any of you have heard of this activity before. It's pretty common in food safety practice, but uh, for the first activity, I'm gonna go ahead and pass around. Uh, we're gonna pretend that this is a contaminated fruit, whether it's someone who came in to work sick and they're handling produce, or whether it's a disease or has bacteria on it. We're going to pretend like this is something that's being handled on the farm or at your home. I'm going to pass this around. Feel free to pass it person to person. At the end, we're going to see just how effective you were using this light. We're going to take a look at your hands. My hands are very dirty because I was trying to put powder on it. <laughs> so we're not going to look at my hands. <laughs> You go, you want to just pass it around. Then this produce is not affected at all. This is perfectly clean. Um, but we'll see that coming in contact with an affected produce um, or people who have touched the contaminated one, we're going to take a look at this one at the end too and just to see how contaminated this one is with the same line. So I'm going to pass you this one out. And um, that's ready. So as we're passing them around, there's other activities that we like to do again with the growers. Um, this is just one of them. This is a fun one, kind of like an icebreaker to, to feel that residue on your on your fingers a little bit. Okay, so as we're passing that around, I'm going to pass you the light now. If you want to just look at your hand and see how contaminated your hands are. We're going to act like the powder, the residue is um, the. Um, so we're going to pretend like they are, you know, microorganisms that we can't see with the naked eye that um, just kind of stick to our hands and we don't wash them correctly. Yeah. Does fruit coming in to the country go to the same breakers as poor people that are you know, growing it? Yeah, so I know that other countries do have different regulations. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what their standards are, but here in California, we do, uh, we, we do try to meet standards for growers who have $25,000 in sales. Um, so I can't speak on what other growers are doing outside of our country. I just kind of know what we've been trained on here in California. I do know that, um, a lot of growers, like, uh, labor costs are going to be cheaper than they are here in California and it's to certain reasons as well. You know, water for it's like the labor's more expensive, things like that. So how would you say the growers are doing so? Um I would say they're doing pretty good. Recently Romero just did a did a tire workshop. Um one of the barriers that, that they face is an invasive species of ants. Um those plants though they do really good in like the drought and here in California. So water's not really an issue. Um, but it just depends on the crop, really. Yeah, I know that marketing could be a big factor too, trying to get your crops out there and sell them to the public. Um, yeah, but my focus primarily is just making sure everyone's reaching food safety standards. Okay, so did you guys all get a chance to look at your hands? And does anyone want to? It's coming wanna... around still. Does anyone want to share their thoughts on this experiment? 
or what they found when they touched the person. So how do you how do you test for this? Uh, because most fruit is coming in with um, cases and such. The only reason why my family is from. Yeah. And so um, we see the cases of uh, produce. Right. How do you how do you check for something like that when so, there's just the amount? Yeah, there is a lot of amount of produce going into our grocery store. I think the first step is um, training and education. So um, it is a requirement um, under the FDA or the CDFA to have certain trainings on your farm if you meet those $25,000 sales. Um, so when the inspectors come, they'll see if you have those trainings in place, if you have the record keeping and the documentation in place. And um, they actually provide you with workshops online over free. Um, that's how I got my training. So I took several trainings on produce safety. You guys would only have to take one of the trainings and you would get a pamphlet with everything that you would need. Um, and then from there, right now, we're going to come up with a traceability rule. So it's going to help. So if anything, let's say, I think there was like a peanut butter one that they were recalling. Um, luckily, that company had a lot number, so they were only able to recall a specific lot. Um, they didn't have to recall their entire peanut butter production. So this traceability rule is going to help farmers um, kind of set them up for if they have a, you know, a disease or someone comes into work sick and there's a, a recall because they found E. coli, at least they know that that specific lot was uh, recalled and all the other ones were saved. So there's certain procedures that we're trying to help farmers uh, or growers um, do, so that way they aren't, um, you know, going to get these major setbacks in their production. So there's a few things we're trying to work on right now. Um, yeah. Just out of curiosity, when, when there is a recall, mm -hmm. um, what do you what do you do with the produce with the products? How do you handle that? Um, I am not sure. I think the grower um, kind of takes a hit on it. I know that if someone gets sick, um, for example, my partner, he had Chipotle, he got sick. He went to the hospital. They found out it was E. coli. The doctors and examiners, they contacted the FDA. The FDA then they contacted him. And there was just a whole, you know, who did you contact? He was on the phone for a while. Um, and then it went back to Chipotle. So then Chipotle had to figure out where, when, how to handle it, and then go from there. Um, so I'm assuming it's a similar practice with farmers, but again, I'm not too sure. We're just kind of trying to help them provide the resources and uh, prevention tips for that to happen. Yeah. There yeah. seems to be more recalls nowadays. Yeah. Uh, you know, I lived in California for a good chunk of my life, and as a younger person, I don't recall. Then making the calls on spinach. I think I remember hearing about a yeah, spinach one. I heard about that and, one as well. And I'm not sure about anything regarding any food oriented that has fruit in it for the work very much. So it seems to be a very particular reason why that seems to be the case. Um, I don't know. It could be that um, maybe more people are reporting it. Um, it could be that there's a lot of growers and not enough inspectors to kind of combat those issues or maybe lack of education. So we're getting funded to educate and help growers um, with food safety. That way that we can prevent these issues. So I think maybe a lack of education. We don't have enough people to spread awareness to everyone. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an issue and we're, we're trying to work on it. So there's other, other organizations and groups like CAF or um, uh, TCOS that um, are all, we're all kind of trying to team together and see what we can do, but yeah. Because no one in the world would have two uh, allegations that you can use like PCR to, use to trace. If this is the disease the person had, the track it to specific on produce for this 30 years ago. Yeah, technology definitely helps to bring up certain diseases and issues. We probably didn't were there present before, but we didn't realize because we don't have the technology to to see it. So yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Ramiro's here, so I'll let him take it away now. But before I do, 
Um, I just want to take a look. So this was the contaminated produce that I passed around. And this was a clean one, but as you can see, it's contaminated as well now. So that just shows the importance of using sanitary procedures on your farm or, you know, in your garden, um, because it could spread easily and we want to prevent that. But that's all for my presentation. Um, again, my name is Ariana Reyes. If you guys have any questions, I'll be here for them. <laughs> I'd uh, like to uh, introduce our next presenter, who is also from University of California, the um, UCCE Corp um, Cooperative Extension, which is a wonderful resource for any of you that are um, in need of uh, uh, assistance on anything. If you want to learn about avocados, you go to the uh, UCCE website on avocados it goes a to z and it'll show you pictures it'll give it type a type b fruit size things like that all kinds of uh really good information um romero lobo uh studied economics at uh, louisa state louisiana state university uh, he's our small farm and agricultural economics advisor for san diego county actually works up in Riverside too, I don't, I believe, don't you? Um, or yeah. somewhat back and forth. And um, um, kind of replaced Gary Bender <laughs> in a way. Uh, no, Gary is irreplaceable. Uh, yeah, Gary, Gary worked with us in our group uh, at our Festival of Fruit. And uh, um, I knew Gary through the um, uh, Macadamia Society uh, annual meetings that we used to have in workshops, but um, uh, Romero is involved with uh, farm management, marketing, and um, he was um, uh, involved with uh, economics and tourism, and um, as I have known, he worked with a couple of neat projects that uh, I was able to uh, get a little bit of the benefits of. Uh, years ago, we had a lovely, um, I guess it was at Alga Road and El Camino Real up in Carlsbad. We had a very, very nice uh, test plot of blueberries. And one of his pet things was pitahaya or dragon fruit. And um, with all of the um, Oriental people in San Diego County, especially Vietnamese and others, that has become a big market and um, is uh, something that is um, um, quite sought after. And it's not uncommon to see people paying four and five uh, up to six dollars a pound for some of the pitahayas in the gro grocery store. So anyway, uh, the, the unfortunately that field fell to a housing development and is no longer there, but I was blessed to be able to get a few of the uh, blueberry plants that were there. And those were some of the best blueberry plants that were grown in the state, I think. Um, anyway, it's uh, my pleasure, as soon as it gets everything set up, to uh, introduce Romero Lobo from the University of California Cultural Extension, Cooperative Extension, who will be teaching us on coffee and other items tonight. And I hope you'll talk a little bit about the Pitahaya as well as um, some of that, uh, uh, the trials that you've had uh, in the county. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Gary. Thank you, appreciate that. That was, uh, yeah, Ramiro Lobo, Small Farms Advisor. Um, you mentioned I went to LSU. So uh, I joke about this uh, here, not in Louisiana, or my Louisiana friends, when they ask me where I'm from, I'm originally from Honduras. I tell them that I moved to Louisiana in, 1990, in 1986, and then I moved to the United States in 1992. <laughs> so accents and all those things kind of, uh, you know, we deal with it. Um, or, uh, or people ask me where, you know, about my accent, and I tell them it's just the uh, 
the, the constant exposure to Mexican food living in San Diego as well. So, so I got excuses for it. And uh, pleasure to be here. Like that, I, uh, I over the years, my uh, a typical of my position is that most form of advisors with the use of systems have a crop assignment. So we hire somebody like Gary Bender. He was our avocado, citrus, and subtropical crops. That was his thing. Uh, we had uh, before him Wayne Schrader, a vegetable crops and strawberries. Uh, we have uh, viticulture advisors, people who work on grapes, uh, olives, or walnuts, or almonds, or whatever, you know, depending on where you are. My position was more of a, of a general appointment to, to work with small scale growers. Excuse me just a second while I look at locate my uh, type here. Uh, that's not for today. <laughs> we can come back and talk blueberries. Where is PowerPoint? UCA and our resources. So before I get into the you know the coffee talk, I wanted to kind of visit with you. No, that's not it. Um, Sorry, it. Uh, I uh, I moved to Mac two years ago, and then it's like my brain is a. And then as I was, I did that as I was getting old, and that's bad combination. Or all there, I should say. Let's see if I can locate it this way. No, not working. But what, what, I'll just continue on and I'll just tell you about it. Um, what um, my position was a small farms advisor. I was, I was hired more to work on, on farm management, ag economics, trying to help farmers. I mean, we knew how to grow things. And we had a cohort of uh, small farm advisors throughout the state that were really good at teaching people how to grow things. But the challenge was, and I tell growers this even today, hasn't changed a bit. I mean, if you dedicate enough time and money about learning how to grow something, you're going to become the best at it. The question is, what are you going to do when you're harvesting whatever it is that you chose to grow? And you'd be surprised how many people grow things. And then, I mean, and it may be a perennial crop, a tree crop. And five years after, they've had they baby those plants for five years. And it's only up until they are ready to harvest that, hey, you know, do you know where I can sell my whatever it is? I mean, and they've had five years of growing those plants to find out about the market. So we, we were... Um, I was hired to kind of help along those lines. And it is a challenge. I mean, we don't have a crystal ball. There are so many issues with, uh, with, um, with crops. San Diego County, we can grow, I mean, the, the county report says, says uh, 200 crops uh, countywide commercially. But, but if you think of it, I think any, no matter, no matter what it is that you can think of in terms of a fruit or plant, I think you can find it in San Diego. Uh, in some cases, commercially or quasi, you know, people will sell a few fruits to neighbors, friends, and that kind of stuff, but, but you will find it. So these are very unique, very small niche crops that are not necessarily, uh, the markets are, the channels are not necessarily well established. I mean, you mentioned dragon fruit. Even today, I started researching dragon fruit in 2004, and I would say the dragon fruit industry in San Diego is pretty well established. Yet the market is very fluid. I mean, marketing is still the biggest challenge. And I'll tell you why. I mean, we think it is. One is our price point for California grown fruit is too high for distributors or, 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 or typical buyers to play with. They, they don't want to risk. They want to make the quick money buying cheap and saying hi. Price point for California grown dragon fruit is organic. It comes in at a higher price than your cheap imports from Vietnam from Ecuador, from Mexico, even though it is a much lesser quality fruit. 
because the dragon fruit that we grow is by far, I mean, I, and I don't have any hesitation to say this, this is the best dragon fruit that you will find anywhere in the world. It is uh, clean, as clean as it can get. We don't get a drop of rain on the fruit. We don't get a pest on it that will actually, other than birds and, and uh, ants and aphids that may damage the integrity of the fruit, it is a very clean fruit. And for the most part, they are grown organically. And even if they are not organic, there is hardly any pest to control. So they, they, they tend to be pesticide wise, a very clean fruit. And we know our soils, you know, tend to be almost inert. So, I mean, soil wise, they, you know, it's like they are pretty clean as well. But again, the, 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 the buyers go for the cheapest, uh, lowest quality fruit because they don't, uh, they don't care about quality really. And consumers will still don't value quality or the fact that something is local to, to, to you know, to be willing to pay a, a higher price for, for whatever it is they were buying, right? So at the, over the years, you know, we work with Fuyo Persimmons, kind of a try to help the Fuyo Growers Association develop a market for them. Uh, it was tough. I mean, I don't know how many of you knew Jim Bathke. Rest in peace. Jim was a great advocate for, uh, for Fuyo. We had a school distributing fruit at schools, doing tastings, and, and again, the, it never took off. Blood oranges. I mean, it's another thing that was kind of when it came in, it was to be the, the, the magic bullet. I mean, it's a very shallow market. It really didn't expand. Um, and on and on. So it's uh, it's been a challenge. And then out of necessity, when then we also started playing with ag tourism along those lines, direct marketing, because we have 26 million people to visit, 26 million visitors, visitor days to San Diego, right? Tourism is the fifth. Uh, the fourth industry in San Diego, agriculture is the fifth. So we thought maybe marrying those two, you know, we'll get something good out of it, right? And uh, and uh, realizing that if we send visitors with, to get them to spend a dollar or two in agricultural products while they're visiting, that will be a significant impact. So we kind of a, kind of a played, a, you know, try to do some work along those lines as well. And right now, what we have in terms of actuarism is a is a project that we call is a product that we call the uh, an actuarism story map. The idea is to help farmers or anyone who is selling directly to the public to list their site in there is kind of an interactive map. You can populate the site with as much information as you want. The idea is that consumers will find you. And then they, you know, you can tell them how to how to how to visit, when you're open, what you're selling, when, and all those different things. Is that that live? Yeah. What's the website? I knew you would ask me. Oh, somebody <laughs> would. Um, I can share because I mean we've been playing with the URL, whether it was a standalone. But if you look at San Diego uh, Actorism Story Map or San Diego Actorism. Uh, it, it'll pop up, and uh, and but the thing is to 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 yeah, just uh, AG tourism, San Diego Act tourism. The thing is for the uh, that's for the public viewable site. The uh, the thing is if you want to get on it, then we can uh, we uh, there is a survey that you have to fill out there, and you can get to it from the site as well, where you can enter your farm or, or business information. And they're categorized by whether you're direct sales, farmers markets, uh, uh, what else do we have in their wineries, uh, educational activities and different things that, that will kind of uh, bring people to your side. So, and I still haven't found my presentation. Hey, hey, uh, your coffee is right there on the- uh, Yeah, but I wanted to-, to We'll go with the coffee. I'll tell you about A and R. So he asked me to tell you about UCA and R. What is UCA and R? How many of you have heard of or seen in, in your readings about crops or plants? Contact your local farm advisor, your local extension advisor. It's a common line in most uh, publications about agriculture, you know, about something new or stuff like that. So we are UCA and R, is University of California Agricultural uh, and Natural Resources. University of California has uh, uh, 10 campuses, so we are the 11. It's, it's a virtual quote unquote campus. We, we depend from the office of the vice president and we are part of the land grant system. Anyone know what the land grant system is? Heard of? Okay. When, when the, um, 
the West was being colonized. Uh, the, 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 the federal government established a land grant university in every state. And uh, each of those universities got a land grant, you know, meaning a piece of land that they could use to do research and train farmers how to grow things. In California, those universities were Berkeley and uh, Riverside. Berkeley dealing more with the natural resources and tree crops that are grown in Sacramento, Central Valley, Riverside growing because of uh, more subtropicals. Over the years, Davis, which used to be a research station for Berkeley, became its own campus. And then now it is, a, it is a, another UC campus. So the, these universities, we do research based on local needs to help growers grow or, or, or you know, become better farmers or decision makers, if you will, if they're managing uh, crops or natural resources. The, the funding is uh, at the local level. We have a presence in every county. So at the local level, our funding stream comes from a three-way uh, sources. I mean, part of it is the federal government, part of it is the state government pays our, our salaries, and then the county government takes a big chunk of that as well because they provide office space and support for the local office. In this case, I mean, it's office vehicles and a few other resources. And in the case of San Diego, they also do lately have been a great source of funding to do like research on specialty crops. So that's uh, that they have been really active along those fronts as well. So the, uh, the university, we are organized again, farm advisors, local presence in every county. We have uh, extension specialists that are based on, on the different, on the land grant campuses. They do more basic research and oftentimes apply research and collaborate. Say I identify a project that I want to work with. Then I contact a specialist and then I kind of reach out and they help me do that project to solve a local need. Um, we have research stations, research centers. The closest to us here is the one in, uh, in Irvine, which is where I do my dragon fruit. And, and I also used to do my blueberry research and now I'm doing my cocoa research there too. And another one is in the desert in the Holtville. How many acres did you have in that blueberry and papaya trial that you were doing in Carlsbad there? That had to have been well, 20 acres at least. No, that, yeah, well, that's the other aspect of it. We do research with collaborating growers. The trial he's referring to was done with collaboration with Valdivia Farms in Carlsbad. They do farm about 80 acres. Yeah. Total, but 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 our little plot was only no, it was it wasn't even half an acre. Yeah. Well, the thing I was maybe half an acre, but the blue no, no, it was been probably four or five acres. No, so, no, they were they were fairly small. Were yeah, I mean, might have looked big, but uh, plants, though. yeah, Hundreds. yeah, might might have looked big, but but it was uh, it wasn't more. I mean, it was a. Uh, it was a 32, we were evaluating 32 varieties of blueberries. So uh, it was 32 times 15. Do the math. My math, my mind is kind of shut. Did you find it? The thing with my laptop though is I don't have an adapter for, oh, well. Yeah, I do have one. They can it apart. Oh, sure. Did you pull this out? That is what.
So um, we that are on the uh, Zoom can hear nothing of the presentation at the moment. We see a slide. Is the speaker muted? Is Ramiro muted? Help. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> okay. In terms of challenges, I mean, you would suspect this. I mean, land and water availability, imports mentioned some of those. I mean, the growth and urbanizations. I mean, we're competing, land farmers compete with uh, developers for land. And actually, developers do hold uh, quite a large number of acres, uh, significant acres in San Diego County, you know, and that, that, that is like in production ag these days in uh, different types of agriculture. Uh, aging farmers. Like, for example, in the macadamia field, most of the people that are growing them are amateur doctors and lawyers and things like that that are looking for an investment for their money. That is, that is pretty typical, I would say. And this is where it gets kind of tricky, you know, because people sometimes call, hey, you know, buying a piece of land in San Diego or house, and uh, what can I grow, you know I mean? And I used to tell people there's really, and realtors will sell prospective buyer. Okay, yeah, we got a nice avocado grove and uh, what have you, a nice macadamia or nice citrus grove. To, but the reality of it is, I mean, that's your part of your landscape. You won't serve as a mortgage with uh, with an agricultural crop in San Diego. I used to tell people there's no legal crop, and then they legalize marijuana. But but, but I don't know if <laughs> but I don't know even with that. I mean, with the prices going the way they are, that that is really a, a viable alternative to try to service your, your mortgage growing something. So what I tell the growers is, you know, when you buy a farm or a house with a big plot of land in San Diego, you're making two decisions. One is you're buying, you're, you're making a real estate decision. You're buying a house with land or buying a piece of land. You're become a, a speculator on land if you buy a plot. And then you try to, to, to make that an agricultural decision, which is not necessarily a good thing to do. So you got to realize that when we look at the profitability or the viability of crops, we never really look at land values. Uh, at, at the at real cost of land as an input into our analysis, because there is no way, I mean, there is no way to, for anything to come back, you know, profitable, right? So we, we assign a rent, we use a kind of a representative rent or a value that uh, for agriculture as an input to grow things. And that sort of uh, brings it down a little bit and, uh, and, and, you know, but yeah, it's two decisions. One is a real, real estate decision, you speculate on land and then you, make a farming decision about what to grow on that piece of land. Okay, now how I advanced here, I didn't realize we were on Zoom. Yeah. I'm responding to me. Yeah. Out there, and um, I'm clearing out some property uh, in, in, in the center of the city. Uh -huh. And as I'm clearing it out, um, clearly there was some kind of agriculture set up there. That's just general. Um, you can even see there were stumps and there's an irrigation system. Um, is old, and I'm pulling it up as I'm clearing out the property. So just just curiosity, uh, what would you speculate would be what they were growing out of? What did you speculate? Probably, probably. <laughs> And it somehow just grew out of the sun, and it's now flourishing. You know, you budded this last year, surprisingly, you know, out of nowhere. Well, I was going to say uh, lemon was uh, <laughs> something that yeah. did that. But, but you know, Southern California was also known for olives. I mean, years past. Okay. Uh, so there used to be a lot of olives being grown. If it is a tree crop, that might have been another. Uh, okay. 
another option. And then, and then, I mean, we used to grow a lot of dry beans. I mean, uh, kind of, an, okay. yeah. Okay. yeah if it is a flat piece beans. of land, it must have been some, yeah, some uh, dry land farming maybe, uh, or, you know, things like that. There, there is definitely a variety. Yeah. It's not just one type. So from Lemon Grove to Bancroft, there were many citrus farms, yeah. and Lemon Grove, of course, got its name from yeah. the orchards. Alonzo Horton even had orchards out there of lemons back hundred over a hundred years ago. Yeah. 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 According to people that live there, you know, when I was a kid. And they say that there were a lot of small individual plots with like citrus trees, and yeah. chicken farm, and there was a bunch of different Miller Dairy there. was there for years. <laughs> No, it's 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 fascinating. It's one of the things that I tell people. The best way to describe San Diego County Ag, how would you describe it? Diverse. Diverse. Yeah, that's but I tell people the best way the best way to describe it is what used to be. If you drive around San Diego with somebody who's been here even months longer than you have, you'll always hear this. Oh, that used to be this. That used to be that. And uh, I mean, Mission Valley was uh, the dairy center of uh, one of. Uh, 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 does. There, there you go. See, I mean, so it. Yep. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's uh, and then obviously diversity is uh, is a key descriptor. So who knows what a small farm is by definition? Who knows what? What a small farm? How? What? What is the definition for a small farm in the U.S.? Well, that's the conversation Oriana and I were having the other day. I mean, it, we don't define it by acre. Do you, I'll, I'll tell you, the USDA definition is any, one, any farm operation that sells or grows us less than $250,000. Over, uh, for many years here in San Diego, in our office, we used $100,000 as the benchmark. And that used to capture about 78% of the farmers in the county that were selling less than 100,000. Um, then the USDA came up with the definition and uh, 250,000 and the percentage only increased to 82%. So there was only a 4% 4, 4 increase in terms of number of farms between 100 and 250. So the challenge, I mean, in San Diego, I mean, 82% are under 250,000 and, and, and the majority of them, as you can see here in the chart is are under $20,000. So it's kind of a supplemental to whatever occupation they may have. But we also have some really large farming operations, you know, growing in the in the millions, you know, and uh, uh, primarily nurseries and a, and a few of the larger avocado groves. So those, um, the definition in terms of acres, you have a 20,000 acre food farming operation growing mushrooms or any other high value item, grows in a million bucks, and then you have a 50,000 acre cattle rancher out in Borrego, you know, grows in $5,000. So, I mean, acreage doesn't really, define what we do here. And uh, it's, it's more about the intensity of what you do. And that's why San Diego has the highest value per acre of any other county in the US. I think the, the total value per acre of agricultural industry is about fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 an acre, meaning that we can we cannot grow you know, raw crops, corn or soybeans or dry beans or, or those kind of things. We have, tend to grow things that are either gonna be eaten fresh, which is kind of a, they command a little bit high, higher price or higher value type items. So I'll go quickly with this. Uh, UCA and R program areas. Um, we can see that we focus on uh, healthy food systems, healthy environment, healthy communities, healthy Californians. And uh, our division really has gone uh, into developing public value statements and uh, making a, a, a huge thing about connecting with the public and, 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 and highlighting uh, what we do and what we contribute to, uh, to the wealth, uh, to the well-being of California as a whole. Uh, sometimes if we work in, uh, in agriculture, those public value statement doesn't necessarily, I mean, it's kind of hard to relate to it, but they tell us they do. So we just kind of go with uh, what, we, what, what directive comes from the top. 
But in terms of, uh, I was telling you about research and information center, we have an agronomy research information center. We have a, a seed biotechnology center, um, UC rangelands, fruit and not that, uh, that had to be uh, changed because it used to be called fruit uh, research. What is it? Fruit Research and Information Center. So I guess people didn't like the acronym, so they had to incorporate uh, nuts in there to make it more uh, sound friendlier. Uh, we have a post harvest center. We have a wheat center, a uh, vegetable research and information center. And so this center really specializes on the specific topics related to the, the, the area of emphasis that they are created for. Center? Center where the no, that's just just has a way. That is the, that is that these are in, in some cases these are virtual. Like uh, the the vegetable research and information center, there isn't. It's affiliated with the UC Davis veg uh, veg science department, uh, veg crops department, but it's more of a virtual thing. And what it is is just a, a a central house for all vegetable related information as part of the UC system. In addition to the uh, genetically modifying of uh, food, are you doing the RNA modification as well? Well, we are, not, I personally am not involved with genetically modifying anything, really. Yeah, I'm not fond of either, personally. I'm, I'm no, just no, 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 I, no, uh, I'm not involved with that. There is, there, I mean, biotech, it, I mean, that's a whole other thing, you know, with, uh, with uh, what we do and, uh, but the biotech industry is quite large, and there is a lot of people at Berkeley uh, that have been doing a lot of work with uh, trying to 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 incorporate. I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, the science community. It's it's you know it's it's kind of hard to stop it, right? So doing uh, you know, on, on certain on certain crops and uh, even with uh, with animals. But I partic I personally am not involved with any of of that research, or have I tried anything? Uh, I, I am aware. That? of scientists seeing more food allergies with the dawn of the release of genetically modified food. Oh, yeah, I mean. Uh, and, and other illnesses as well. Yeah, I mean, I-, I, I I'm certainly... not a fan of it. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's, it's a public opinion. Uh, it's, it's divided. It's not that, a yeah. public opinion. It's a scientific research discovery. By, by people that look at health. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, uh, it's uh, like I said, I mean, uh, people who, who, who research it, they, they, they do it, people who oppose it. I mean, there are, there are opposing views, I mean, and, uh, and, and they can be well justified. Like I said, I personally don't, uh, don't engage uh, in any of those in my research program. Now that we're supposed to get labeling of genetically modified foods, but that hasn't been worked out yet. I, isn't there a federal law to that effect now? I am, I, I'm not familiar with that. Like I said, I'm not working with GMOs at all. So I don't know what the regulatory, uh, what the regulations are. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. So, I mean, in terms of what we can do, I mean, resources from the university for you guys, I would say these are probably the centers the programs that would be more applicable. One is the UC integrated pest management information. I mean, you, if you go to, how many of you have you visited that site? The uh, UC integrated pest management inf uh, website. It's got a lot of information on how to manage pests. I mean, uh, from the, the organic culture, I mean, from, from cultural management, uh, to, to even uh, pesticide trials and efficacy trials and say what works best under what condition. And it's searchable by pest, searchable by crop. And uh, there is recommendations for home gardeners, for commercial growers. So that would be a, a useful site that I highly recommend if you ever run into, uh, into pest problems uh, in your crops. The Ag Issue Center, uh, that center publishes uh, crop budgets, enterprise crop budgets uh, or, or Enterprise, it does enterprise analysis for crops that are grown in the state. And if you're thinking about growing a specific crop, you go in, you find a crop budget. It may not be for San Diego County, although there are a few for San Diego. But the idea is that you kind of get a sense of what it takes to grow a crop commercially. And then you draw your own numbers and try to, there is a column in there that you can plug in your own numbers 
and then have a sense for whether you know it may be profitable or not for you locally. Uh, you see master gardeners, any master gardeners in the audience? One? Anyone can call to the master gardeners on the 858 phone number and get plant health information, test information, anything. It's great. Yeah, I think that's one of the great resources for, for our communities because uh, they do manage a hotline where you can you, you grow something in your backyard and you have a problem, a uh, disease or whatever, you call the Monster Garner hotline and, uh, and there's people dedicated to answer, uh, you know, backyard type uh, residential homeowner type uh, questions. If, um, if you're interested in the program, I certainly send information. It is, uh, it is handled. Uh, uh, we have uh, the commitment is that you, you undergo a year long training on a variety of topics, and then you are committed to provide, I think, 25 hours per year of, of service on a variety of topics, whether it is, you know, attending the hotline, uh, some of the activities that they organize or helping with community gardens in the area and the communities where you are. So it is a great way to, to, to kind of learn more about yourself, about, you know, how, you know, how to grow vegetables, fruits, and all those different things, and also how to help and support your local communities, which I think is the greatest benefit of it. And it connects these communities to the university. And if uh, the hotline person cannot answer the call, then some questions are channeled to us. I mean, say in this case about dragon fruit, it will end up with me being that, that I'm the guy that is doing research on dragon fruit or blueberries. And then uh, it's kind of at the gateway to the greater University of California system. So that I would encourage you to use it. 4 H Youth Development Program. It's, uh, it's also a wonderful program for kids. How many of you were in 4 H? handful yeah great yeah. so it's a great resource to, to get people engaged you know kids engaged in in agriculture i mean uh, to to teach them about just being a personal growth in many fronts yeah so it is a great program as well and then the nutrition um education program that all the, there is a cohort of community education uh people who who help you help uh, doing classes, nutrition classes, trying to teach people how to eat healthy, how to use different foods if you need be. And they work mostly uh, with schools, but also with, uh, with communities. So if there is an interest, uh, that is uh, as well as a, a good group to, to connect with. And then the UC Master uh, Food Preserver Program. We don't have that in San Diego County, but, but I think they do that in and this teaches people how to preserve food, you know, canning and uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of different methods to to preserve foods. Uh, and then all of these are about each of these specific projects. And I'll cut it there just to to kind of switch on to the other presentation, if I may. It's not showing in Zoom, is it? Or was it? I keep showing in Zoom. Okay. But is that still a thing? I think we get to stop and, and reach here probably would be the better way to do it. How are, how are we doing on time? Uh, is you guys want a break? Now? Yeah, we can. The reason I was asking, I brought coffee for you. Do you who, who drink coffee at night? Okay, I got three samples of coffee back there, and I was going to be part of the conversation. I'm, a, 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 I'm sorry I'm late, but then I brought some cups. I forgot the sampling cups, but I had some. Um, Try them all three and then tell me, you tell me, just kind of a zip for each one of them and tell me which one you'd like better. They are three different processes in those coffees. They are not the same variety, but there are three samples uh, and each one is processed differently. And, and I'd like for you to try them and see if you can pick up the differences in flavor in general. I mean, uh, it's not varietal experiment, but just kind of a, if you can pick up the flavor that each process uh, done. So if you want to do that, well, we okay. Yeah, we're gonna. Sorry. 
Phillips are there. We're gonna pause the Zoom and uh, take some coffee. And all of any of those. Uh, hey everyone, we're back. Um, this is uh, the second of yeah. the presentation for Mayor Lobo. Um, so enjoy. For men, people on Zoom, please put your questions in the chat. And after the presentation, Ramiro will get to them. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, let's talk about coffee now. Did you guys try the coffees? Which one do you like uh, better? Number two. You said who, who liked number one? You did. Why Why did you like number one? Yeah, it's, well, I'll tell you, number one is uh, it's, it's a natural, natural process coffee. And I'll tell you what that means you know, in the presentation. Number two is a honey processed coffee. And number three is a washed coffee. Um, the challenge with this is it's not the same variety process using the different methods, but I just wanted to kind of highlight that the different processes will give you different profile, you know, flavor profiles. Uh, when we do this by variety, it's, it's kind of a nicer because, you know, it's the same variety and you try to roast them uh, the same uh, dark, I mean, the same roast type uh, roast profile, and then you grind in the same and you brew them the same and then it showcases the, the flavor that way better than um, than this. But yeah, I just wanted to kind of do a little exercise. And there is more coffee to drink if you guys need some. <laughs> Who's got the night shift? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I mean, if you're, you know. <laughs> we can give you a disclaimer for your boss tomorrow. You kind of all... all right. So uh, as, as, as a matter of, uh, uh, of an overview, I'll talk a few facts and figures about U.S. coffee industry, about the taxonomy of it. Uh, try to differentiate between the Tipica and Bourbon, and even the Robusta or or Canephora line. Uh, some coffee production in California, a few growing tips, uh, harvesting, processing, and storage used by you know for information purposes. I know we don't. Although I'm doing a, a kind of a series of uh, videos for how to process small quantities of, of coffee. And uh, I wish we had time to show you those, but I can share them with you later. Essentially, if you have a plant or two, you know, we used to squeeze each bean individually and get the, I mean, it's sherry and then get those beans out. So now what I'm using is more of a cereal corn grinder, familiar with those. And then I use them to separate the pulp from the beans. And then once the uh, parchment is dry, I kind of run it through the same grinder and I separate the, uh, the parchment from the green beans, and once I roast it, I kind of grind it in the same grinder. So it's a, it's a multi. So the pulp is actually seems to be quite tasty. Is there a way to get the pulp off so that you can eat that, and then kind of use it as a drink of lots of flavor for your coffee? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you uh, if you can save the pulp and separate it, and uh, and either dry it, that's actually a, a kind of a. I was I was going to say that uh, they uh, well you can dry it up. One of one of the uh, secondary product to coffee is something called cascara, which is pretty much the dry pulp uh, used as an infusion. You know, you kind of grind it and use it as a tea, and it's got some caffeine in it. I mean, not as much as coffee, but but it's got a, a flavor, a little bit of flavor and caffeine in it, so that you can do that. But quality wise, you got to handle it really well, you know, before when you get the cherries, you got to rinse them, you got to wash them and make sure that the cascara is, is pretty much in there, you know, before you dry it out. Uh, okay, so it's uh, coffee, second most traded commodity in the world, second to oil. So it's a pretty significant. Five billion cups drank daily. And uh, 14 billion are Italian espressos. So talk about getting a coffee, a jolt of coffee, right? And by the way, uh, Italian espresso, do you know what goes in as a recipe? 
80% of it, supposedly the most common recipe, 80, that's why they are so strong and, and dark. 80% of, uh, of, uh, of the coffee in the espresso is, is robusta. And then they use a 20% of Arabic that used to give it a little bit of make it more palatable. That's why they tend to be a really strong, almost bitter, you know, when you, when you have a shot of uh, espresso. Um, 25 million people are supported worldwide with, with coffee production activities. 90% uh, of production occurs in developing countries. And um, Finland drinks the most coffee. The US ranks 25 in terms of uh, coffee drinking, but, uh, but it's the largest buyer worldwide uh, in terms of the, the amount of coffee that we import. Uh, 37 coffee, some negative aspects of it, producing countries listed in the World Wildlife Fund as uh, with the highest deforestation rate. So it's, uh, you, I mean, some people argue that, uh, yeah, you clear native trees and you plant these coffee trees, but you know, it's not necessarily the case. I mean, uh, if you're clearing out really old trees to plant coffee trees, I mean, there is a lot of disturbance to the environment and the, uh, and the diversity gets impacted as well, so. Coffee producing countries, uh, Brazil is by far the largest. They produce about 60 million, uh, 100 pounds, uh, 100 weights. Uh, Vietnam is, uh, is a distant second and then Colombia. I mean, Indonesia, the difference here is that Brazil is mostly Arabicas with some uh, Robustas, whereas the Thai, uh, Vietnam and Indonesia, they tend to be mostly Robustas uh, coffees. And uh, Colombia, it's mostly Arabicas. Ethiopia, obviously Arabicas. And in Ethiopia and Africa, they tend to grow more some of the heirloom varieties. Uh, and we'll talk more about those uh, in, a, in a moment. And then uh, Peru, India, Honduras. And this data is uh, it's not the most recent uh, numbers, but, uh, but it kind of a, a few places may have shifted uh, in order. Yeah. Uh, the retail value of the coffee uh, industry in the U.S. is 48 billion. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, pretty significant. And 55% uh, of those are considered specialty coffees. And we'll uh, also talk about what a specialty coffee is. 48% of, uh, by, by the same token, 48% of the coffee consume, uh, consumers think it, see them as specialty coffees. Um, daily consumption between the younger generation is, is, fairly, is sort of declining. Uh, among me, you know, 25 to 39 year olds, but the younger groups are increasing, are, are, is increasing. I mean, and not necessarily in hot beverages, but I mean, with so many variations of coffee, with your cold brews and and your mochas and lattes and all these different drinks that are that people are buying these days, the uh, hot coffee uh, it's it's almost become secondary as more you know as most coffee shops. Um, as I mentioned, the U.S. is the world's largest single buyer with 25, 27 and a half million uh, 100 pound bags. Uh, over half of Americans drink coffee daily. And, um, and those who drink coffee drink on average three and a half coffee, uh, cups a day. So we get 75% of our caffeine intake from coffee. And the other 25, maybe, I don't know, uh, Coca-Cola or, or, you know, yeah, carbonated drinks, Red Bull, what have you, I don't know. So in terms of taxonomy and varieties, the, uh, this is the tree that depicts, uh, I would probably get here, is in the Arumiae family. We have four primary species, American, Antonia, out of the continuous, we get the Arabic and the Ethiopian line. The story goes that he was discovering Kenya by his dogs eating his chairs out there and then going crazy. And the owner noticed that the, the, the goats got highly uh, energetic after eating these cherries that were grown in the wild. So they decided to, hey, harvest some, roast them, and uh, they started to drink coffee. 
out of those, <clears throat> some of those lines were taken to, uh, an accession was taken to Yemen. It was still the Yemen accession. From Yemen, some plans were taken to the Netherlands, which is the typical line, and others were taken to Reunion Island by the French, which is now the island of, of the island of Bourbon, which is near Mad Madagascar, I believe. I mean, if my geography is right. So those are our two main Arabica lines, Pipica and Bourbon. So all the varieties, Arabica varieties that we grow today or hybrids have their origin with those two lines, Pipica or Bar. All the green varieties, this is what I was referring to as heirloom varieties. These are varieties that have been largely unmodified and that are grown primarily in Asia. And the best quality, quote unquote, flavored coffee, you get them with the green varieties. This is where a geisha line is in here somewhere. Uh, where is the geisha? Yeah, geisha. Geisha has been uh, or become the darling of the coffee industry. I mean, it's it's almost uh, <clears throat> it's a high quality coffee. But again, it, it, it it's kind of one of those things. Who? What is the best coffee for you guys? <clears throat> Ethiopian, but what, what what I mean, flavor wise. Light, strong, dark. Yeah. Number two is a blend, but is a and then then we try to roast them in a, to a medium grade. It's just that it is a honey process. <clears throat> so what, what what I was trying to get at is that this variety, the green varieties, like the geisha, for example, you brew geisha compared at the same roasting level as any other, it, it's, 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 it's kind of a light coffee, very light color, very smooth, very uh, high acidity, very, uh, it doesn't, it, it looks like an infusion really, it's not necessarily, it doesn't look like coffee. I mean, like uh, the, the French roast that we used to think of <laughs> in the Starbucks, Pike's Place or, or French roast that we used to, I used to think of as the best, you know, as the good coffee. So it's been more about the learning process about what good coffee is. But to give you an example, geisha is the variety of choice for barista competitions. That's what they compete with because of the profile that, you know, the flavor profile that it provides. And, uh, and it is the one that is considered the highest quality coffee. I mean, uh, typically in cupping scores, which is a way to, to judge the quality of coffee, is the one that scores in the 90s, you know, 90, 91 versus uh, a special and anything that above 80 is considered specialty coffee by the uh, specialty coffee association. So if it is a, anything higher than 80, it's considered specialty coffee. But nowadays, if you have a coffee that is in the low 80s, eh, people don't even look at it. I mean, there is, a, and I don't know if it is that everything is being inflated, that, that, that scores in cupping scores with coffee, See, that keeps creeping up, you know, they keep getting higher and higher. So now for a coffee to be kind of considered more specialty informally though, because by definition it's 80 and above, but you gotta be scoring in the 85 range, you know, for it to be uh, in the conversation, if you will. Most cup of excellence winners are in the 89 to 91 and a half. And typically Geisha is the one that gets the, uh, the, the higher scores. And I'll tell you a story about the coffee prices and all that. But, but they tend to be heirloom varieties, highly regarded as, as high quality coffee. But as anything that is heirloom, what are some issues that you might anticipate with it? Low productivity, weaker plants, harder to grow. And, and all the, 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 I mean, it's a battle to grow them, right? And that's why they are very grown in uh, like a geisha versus a katura. With a geisha, you can expect to get 50% of the yield that a katura plant will give you and in double the amount of years uh, before they start producing. Say a katura will start growing commercial, commercial harvest at three years, a geisha will be five plus. The root system for geisha plants is pretty weak. And so it is a challenge to grow them. And, and so that's the trade of that some growers you know, have to make. You, you go for higher quality or you go for higher yields. And um, 
So the Tipica, you know, we have a long number of varieties that are grown there. On the Bourbon line, most of the, uh, the varieties that we grow in Latin America are mutations of Bourbon, really. And uh, coffee is a self-pollinating fruit, plant, self-fertile. The literature reports that 90% of the flowers are pollinated before they open. So you have that 10% variability that has sort of given origin to some of the newer varieties that are natural mutations. For example, the um, out of that line, we have pacas is a natural mutation. Some others are, are crosses. And then uh, Socatura used to be the standard variety for Latin America, the most productive variety. Then uh, Libros hit in the uh, late 70s, 80s and annihilated production pretty much everywhere. So there was a, a out of the, the Canepro line, there was a hybrid in Timor Island that was identified and uh, people realized that it didn't get rust. So they started crossing that hybrid with some of the varieties that were grown in Latin America. They, they were growing, uh, uh, they crossed the Timor hybrid with Katura, with either red Katura or with yellow Katura or with another variety that was popular in Costa Rica called VSRC, which is another selection of, uh, of Bourbon. And a lot of the names, you, you, I mean, I haven't done the testing, but the thing is, I think that a lot of the names are pretty much country-based for the same genetic material that came out of a research center in Brazil. So you may find that the, 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 the same genetics are named differently in different countries, right? Like VSRC is more of a Costa Rican name, um, Captura came out of Brazil. So today in the industry, the varieties that are mostly grown are either descendants of a Timor hybrid times red Katura, and those are called, there is a line of varieties called Catimores, Cat, uh, Timor, the, the Catimor line, right? And the same applies to plants that came out of the cross between uh, Timor hybrid and yellow, Katura, and yellow Katura. Then the other group of varieties, there is a cross between Timor hybrid and the Sarchi, and those are called Sarchi Moors. So those are the two main lines of hybrids that are actually farmed commercially today in the world. So uh, most of the crosses out of the uh, yellow Katura times Timor kind of a state in Colombia. We have a line called Colombiana, Castillo, and, uh, and, 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 and others. Uh, that got farmed out all over the place. So that's kind of the uh, the gist of uh, coffee varieties and coin lines and the uh, in terms of how many accessions or varieties they are. The uh, CATIE, which is a, this, the, an institution in Costa Rica, they have a germplasm collection with 2,900 lines of coffee. So there is a, I mean, it's been around about 2,000 years. I mean, it's, it's a, a lot of uh, crosses, a lot of mutations, a lot of selections, even with the geisha, which people claim is the, the highest quality coffee, they have about 29 different lines of geisha. So which one is the one that, uh, that produces um, the best coffee? Uh, and, and the answer to that is it's uh, Panamanian geisha. Geisha has become the, the, the flag variety for Panama. So when we talk about what's uh, the, the impact of origin, Geisha uh, started winning uh, coping competitions, as I mentioned, right? Or, or, or barista competitions all over the place. And then everybody and their dog tried to grow Geisha in, uh, in, in coffee growing regions. But what's in a name, what's in the origin? I'll give you an example, I think it's 2019, Honduras Cup of Excellence, Geisha won. As a honey process geisha, one cup in cup of excellence, and the winning cup is sold in international auction for about eighty-two dollars a pound, which is pretty high, right? Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, Guatemala, same variety, geisha variety, honey processed, one cup of excellence, sold for sixty-five dollars a pound. But six weeks later, Costa Rica, same variety geisha, same process. Cup of excellence winner, a cup of excellence winner sold for uh, three hundred dollars a pound. Okay, and about two months later, Panama, 
they don't call it Cup of Excellence. They call it Best of Panama, their competition. But Best of Panama winner, same variety, Geisha, processed as a honey, $1,200 a pound. So that's kind of out of my cooperative extension salary to try, but I don't know about you guys. And, uh, and typically the, the people or buyers for those high-end coffees are either, for, you know, in Saudi, I mean, in Asia, Koreans uh, typically are the ones paying those kind of prices. Yes, sir. Well, you see the, the, the thing is you get a pound of green coffee and these are efficiency ratios that change with variety and also with, uh, with uh, altitude. But you need in Central America or, or, or typically in, in coffee growing regions, five pounds of cherries to get a pound of green coffee. So when you see most packaging in coffee with either, either ground or, or uh, whole beans that is bagged, you'd see 12 ounces, right? It's kind of a typical to see a 12 ounce bag. And that is because you roast a one pound of green coffee you end up with about 12 ounces of roasted coffee. And based on a standard recipe, you get about 40 cups out of a pound of green coffee. So that Panamanian coffee, I think when they bought it was a partnership between, a, it was a split lot between someone in San Francisco and a, and a group out of Korea. And they did a cup in San Francisco and they were selling at $75 a cup. And they sold out. So it is just the experience. Uh, the most I pay for a Copa Geisha is when I went to Panama and uh, one of the farms that had won Best of Panama and they were selling, you know, a Copa Geisha for eight bucks a cup. And, uh, and that hurts, still hurts. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I mean, so th there is people, you know, paying high value for these coffees. Yeah. It's a number of factors. There's 10 components to it. I mean, it's flavor, aroma, body, uh, cleanliness, acidity, uh, defects, visual defects. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these factors. You score from up to 10, and then you get the, uh, the score. Uh, how standard is it? I mean, the, the Specialty Coffee Association, they train, uh, they develop this, this scoring system. And, uh, and they, uh, it's kind of, it fascinates me, you know, kind of a, someone in the U.S. decided what, how to judge coffee that is grown in the tropics, you know, I mean, it's, and then the flavors. I mean, when you, will, and this is my beef with it, with the system, because the flavors are, you know, like the whole, uh, Peach. I mean, all temperate climate type fruit. And I said, why didn't they use guavas, passion fruit? I mean, tropical fruit. I mean, it's a tropical fruit, right? Because coffee is a fruit, but uh, but that's not the case. So yeah, that's what they do. Well, but yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they the thing is they they were first at it, so they developed the the standard. And now it, it is uh, there is a, a wheel, a flavor wheel where they trained you on and uh, it's kind of a, I've tried to learn how to cup coffee and my palates won't let me. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 what you roast is actually a nut. I mean, it's, you could, yeah, you're right. I mean, then it's oh it is a fruit yeah i mean uh yeah no totally it is a, it is a fruit it is a bay type fruit with the uh... no no it's it's more of a variety thing uh what 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 rose does it's uh, increase the acidity it, it, you burn it to the point that you kind of extract the oils in that coffee See, the, the lighter the roast, the closest to the, what that variety of flavor should be. As you increase, and that's why the medium roast is sort of the happy medium between, you know, having a kind of a decent uh, darkness coffee and, uh, and still showcasing some of the variety of flavors. 
and uh, especially when you get into into this this honey or natural processed coffee, which tend to have higher sugar content, I mean more sugar, or uh, because they are dry with the with the some of the mucilage on, and that's what the processing methods are. And I will talk about it later. But, I mean, hopefully, if I keep talking. <laughs> well, uh, it can be one of many varieties. Oh. I mean, there are the, yeah, the different varieties. We'll have uh, either yellow, red, pink. Also, yeah, but typically, I mean, I would say it's probably a katwai, oh. yellow katwai. Yeah, it's probably a yellow katwai, but there is a yellow katura. There is ikatu that comes in yellow as well. Yeah, most varieties, several varieties have a, a yellow and a red version of them. Yeah, and, and they behave different, like, for, for example, in Hawaii, the Kauai Coffee Company, they grow primarily yellow katwai, and uh, essentially because it comes off the plant a lot easier. Yeah, they are kind of a mid, uh, probably semi-dwarf, and we'll talk about plant structure in a minute if we get to it. So taxonomy, it's a Rubiaceae family, just the coffee or matter family, genus coffea, um, with about 100 to 120 species. And uh, only three species are commercially relevant. This is the Arabica, which encompasses about 70 to 80% of the what of coffee that is grown for consumption. And then the uh, Carcophea canephora, which is the uh, Robusta, and a few lines of eugenioids, which is kind of the heirloom varieties that we were talking about. And uh, Liberica also is grown commercially, but very marginally, uh, it's not a, a huge species grown. Um, Arabica is a genus and a species for Arabica coffee. Cofea canephora is for the Robusta coffee. The junioids, it's, um, again, this is grown mainly in Africa in smaller quantities. And uh, it is a diploid parent of Cofea Arabica. Remember when we talked about the, the two lines of Typica and, and the Bourbon lines? And um, and the other one is Liberica, but again, very little commercial value, although it is it does have some. Yeah. So how many types of coffee? Essentially, we have two. I mean, either the Arabica or the Robusta. Those are the two main things. And the uh, difference is the taste. I mean, Arabica, it's got the better taste, the better flavor. Robusta is typically described as burnt rubber. So I don't know if that sounds appealing to you, but but, but that is, uh, flavor is not good. Uh, coffee in content, Robusta has about twice the amount that Arabica has. And that's why it is used in espressos, uh, you know, and uh, usually it's a darker roast uh, coffee, so 2.7% versus 1.5%, and that gives it the, the, the bitter flavor. In terms of uh, price, Arabica sells, uh, well, Robusta sells are by, by about 60% of the value of Arabica coffees, and that fluctuates, obviously. So if you get a dollar for, Arabica, for an Arabica coffee, you get about 60 cents to the pound for the Robusta. But they are a lot bigger. Yeah, not necessarily. Uh, the, the the beans tend to be small, rounder. The plants are much bigger, and they are more vigorous, higher productivity. I mean, they they are bulletproof, are nematode resistant to nematodes, resistant to the to the fungus that causes a uh, rust. But yeah, but the flavor. And some countries don't allow it. Honduras, for example, does not allow robusta to be grown because they say that it will diminish the perception of quality for Honduran coffee. Uh, Colombia, they grow it, uh, it's very restricted. They don't uh, necessarily grow it uh, in, in large quantities, but it's not illegal. Uh, Brazil grows uh, probably about 80, 20, uh, 70, 30, 70 Arabica versus 30 Robustas. Southeast Asia is it's, uh, because of, uh, it, it's grown in lowlands. Robusta is also called like lowland coffee. So it grows uh, in the Southeast Asia and that's pretty much all they grow. Um, hmm? Yeah, yeah, and more, I mean, it's, it's a much stronger plant. Even today now, there are Robusta is being used as a rootstock for some Arabica coffees, especially if you're growing them on 
on nematode uh, infested soils or, or areas that uh, we wanted to do a trial here to see if, uh, if robust uh, rootstocks would be more drought tolerant. And, and, and get a stronger plant for this type of environment. But uh, again, never got, haven't gotten funding to do it. And uh, so we play with seedlings. Uh, plant height and bean shape, most of the plants are massive, taller, beans tend to be rounder. And uh, whereas Arabica, it, the, even if the more heirloom the variety, the longer the beans, I mean, they tend to be kind of elongated, skinny and long. Um, Chlorogenic acid or CGA content, which is a, kind of a, an antioxidant um, uh, component or, or, or chemical in the coffee, and also the thirst insect is much much higher in robusta than it is in arabica. Uh, and again, arabica accounts for about seventy five percent of the coffee grown in the world, and robusta makes up the twenty five percent. So we have varieties, cultivars, and hybrids, and um, variety is uh, just below the, the species, and these are pretty stable in many ways. Um, cultivars are almost variety, but they tend to be more, more uh, not as stable. They, over time, they tend to degrade, and they don't hold the genetic identity that you would like to see. And then the hybrids we mentioned is combination of two different species, and primarily you know between the hybrid from Timor and the uh, and some of these other uh, descendants of uh, Bourbon that have been hybridized, and where we get the heterogeneity and the vigor and uh, and some resistance to, to to leaf rust. Although, as we say in uh, in uh, in agriculture, I don't know if you've seen the saying that diamonds are forever, right? So the saying in ag is that diamonds are forever, but resistance is not. So um, the, 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 the fungus that causes the Milea mastatric, which causes the leaf rust, I think they have uh, every so oft, every two or three years, they get a different race of the fungus. So it cracks the code of resistance on some of these hybrids, and then they become susceptible. So they are most tolerant, not necessarily resistant, and it's not, it doesn't last long. For example, Honduras, there was a variety called Empira, which was promoted in the 80s as a resistant variety. Now it's uh, susceptible to the fungus, and people are replacing it with other varieties that are showing more tolerance to it. Yes, sir? Uh, I mean, it's uh, the fungus is a living organism. That, to find ways to, you know, preserve itself. So I think uh, the same way coffee plants mutate, the fungus does the same thing and different, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and on the right conditions of, you know, high humidity, temperature, uh, the, the fungus will propagate and go through multiple cycles. And then out of those, you know, one of them will be able to crack the code and... Right. Yes, yes. Well, it's the challenge. Your higher quality varieties are more susceptible to the fungus. So you play the game. I mean, you grow varieties, say, like uh, Colombia, which is it's just a variety, right? Uh, and uh, or Lempira, which are highly productive, vigorous, and have some resistance to the fungus, but they usually score very low in copying competitions. So if you are growing commodity coffee, I guess you're fine with growing some of the uh, these bulletproof type hybrids. But if you want to get a more of a differentiated coffee and uh, and um, and a, you know try to hit, go to the, uh, the specialty coffee trade or market, then you kind of risk your neck out a little, you know, stick your neck out a little bit by growing uh, varieties that are higher quality, but lower, but more susceptible. I mean, and, and disease management is a challenge because there is a three-legged monster. I mean, you have to have the genetics of the plant, the environment, and then nutrition. I mean, those three, if you, nutrition plays a huge role in terms of how tolerant the plants are to the, to the fungus, but Again, you know, you get negative. Sometimes you get days and days of rain and high temperature, and boom, you know, the fungus just explodes. So it is a balance. I mean, it, it all depends what you as a producer want to do 
what market you're going for, and then you, you know, you choose varieties that will a, fit that profile. No, 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 we don't have the rust. Yeah, right. No. It's up probably going to be about stock for what plants no, I would say 95, probably higher percent of the coffee farms are uh, seedlings. Yeah. So they're they, usually seed. Yeah, propagated by seed. Now, they, like I said, the Robusta, Robusta lines, there is a Robusta line called Nimaya that is used as a, primarily as a rootstock, trying to, again, to, to give the plants, uh, have a stronger plant, the more tolerant to to the environment, to climatic factors, and also to nematodes, because they don't get affected by nematodes. So that's a big plus. If you have a nematode problem, then grafted plants uh, are the way to go. But it's not a common practice. Even today, I mean, uh, there is a group called the World Coffee Research, uh, based out of Texas A&M, that they are, they are doing, uh, what they are promoting is, is F1 hybrids. Uh, they, they are hybridizing plants and then they are propagating the, the first uh, progeny out of those. <clears throat> they are using tissue culture, but there are still a lot of issues with tissue culture plants because apparently the, the coffee, and, I, and I'll show you some photos of a seedling, the quality control starts with seedlings. You want a plant that has a straight roots and, uh, and, and typically when you germinate seeds, you get the the root is longer than the than the top. You know when you pull them out of the seed bed, so it it's got a tap root that allows them to kind of mine water, right? And and a tissue culture plant because there is no tap root, the root is very fibrous and superficial, and the plants are susceptible to 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 drought and also to tip over. The other thing is the growth because uh, depending where you get that that. Um, that uh, tissue that you're propagating from, you can get a plant that is more spreading as opposed to being vertical. So they say that makes a difference or you got to propagate, you know, the apical nerve stem so that they have that upgrowth tendency to it. But again, it's a lot of uh, research that I haven't really done. I mean, it's based on what I've read. No first-hand experience with this. But there are some F1 hybrids that are being promoted and propagated uh, sexually, you know, by uh, tissue culture. So Arabica versus Bourbon, we kind of talk about this. I'll just breeze through it. These are some of the typical cultivars. I'll just kind of uh, go through the slides. Uh, oh, the one thing that I want to mention here is the uh, the Kona. How many of you guys think of Kona is actually from Hawaii? Kona coffee is from Hawaii. Well, Kona is a typical, it's, it's a typical line that was taken to Hawaii from Guatemala. Yeah, but somehow, you know, this talk about the terroir plays a big factor. So the variety itself sort of a, uh, produces some specific characteristics that makes it uh, different than what you would get from the same line. Uh, I mean, and I don't know if anybody's compared in a coping competition, you know, the typical from Guatemala and who knows which farm it went from. Uh, versus what's grown in Hawaii as a Kona coffee. But yeah, it's a, it's a typical line that it's yeah, known so as. Not, yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think they, but did you, they, it's, it's kind of a Kona blend that they are yeah. marketing and they've got to be 10% Kona grown coffee though. Yeah. yeah. And the rest it's of it can. Yeah. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. That's where the terroir comes into play. Yeah, it's like wine. I mean, and right now there is people that are getting into these uh, coffee fermentation. I mean, the, the biggest thing with coffee is, is fermentation. You know, what type of fermentation you use and what kind of yeast or, or, or organism you use to enhance the fermentation. So a lot of people are actually doing, uh, isolating what microbes are in coffee farms to try to propagate them and grow them and culture them and then use them to enhance the flavor of that particular coffee. I mean, it, it's a, a lot of stuff that is kind of a way over my head, you know, but, uh, but a lot of uh, interesting things happening with fermentation in coffee to, again, to try to differentiate it, to get into these uh, unique quality attributes that uh, through, through, through the fermentation process. Uh, bourbon cultivars, again, a whole bunch of them, typical bourbon crosses. 
The Timor hybrid, I mentioned this, is a naturally naturally occurring uh, <clears throat> cross between Canephora and Arabica, and that was the origin of many other hybrids. The question though, and I asked this from some uh, some coffee presentations, I mean, what happens if you keep inserting more Timor hybrid genes into the Arabica coffees? At what point, you know, you, uh, or when, how far can you go before we have to stop calling it Arabica? And then, well, okay, well, you know, we kind of do these crosses, get to the point where we get the resistance we want, and then we back cross it to try to bring back the bring back the Arabica component to it. But again, the, the Arabica, it's, it's sort of a diluted term because of that, because we're inserting more genes or more uh, of the Timor hybrid into, which is a canephora, um, into some of these varieties. And yet some of them, like, I mean, you're, you're hybridizing and you're getting a ton of different, I mean, thousands of plants, some of them end up having good flavor profiles, even if they are a hybrid. So as you can see the plants, I mean, that's a massive, huge leaves. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a bulletproof plant. And there's a number of, like I mentioned, varieties that have a Timor hybrid origin that are grown commercially these days. And then these are a lot of Ethiopian and Sudanese coffees that tend to be more on the heirloom type that I was telling you. And the geisha is by far the most popular of them all. Then you have Rumet Sudan, um, <clears throat> that is quite popular as well. And uh, which other one? Sidamo is quite popular. Uh, the one I'm familiar with. Those are the two that I'm most familiar with out of this bunch. Uh, coffee structure. So you have plants, uh, some of these hybrid coffee plants can be a dwarf or a semi-dwarf or a tall plant. The uh, the typical lines or heirloom types tend to be on the tall side. They, uh, the, the, the inner nodes are longer, uh, longer distance. The angle is more like a 45 degree uh, at angle, maybe less than a 45 degree. And they, they are kind of lanky. They look tall and then lanky, so when they get loaded, they get droopy because of the weight. And if you don't uh, manage the height, they can get up to 10, 12 feet high. I mean, to the point that you have to hook them, you know, to bring them down and bend them to harvest them by hand. The uh, Katura type, they tend to be dwarf. And then some of the hybrids that I mentioned tend to be in kind of in between, you know, tend to be like, you know, but usually in a commercial farm, you try to top them at about 180, you know, six feet high. Up my height, you top them, and then do you, you keep? Do you remove the, uh, the 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 apical shoot, and then you manage that height once they reach they reach uh, six feet, and then you just keep kind of uh, removing the shoots that come out, trying to grow high. Because as you know, when you prune a plant, all you do is stimulate new shoots to come out of that point, right? When you make the cut. So uh, it's a practice to kind of remove those shoots uh, as they start emerging, because you want to grow the stem and you want to that plant to, to feed your the, the, the branches, lateral branches that are below. I'll just go through this. By the way, this is uh, this is out of uh, the World Coffee Research. If you Google World Coffee Research, they have a catalog of varieties that with a lot of information about each individual variety that are the <clears throat> varieties that are commercially grown. That is, so you can Google that up, and all this information came from that site. Robusta, Catuai from Brazil, Pacamara is kind of the flagship variety from El Salvador. They won Cup of Excellence, uh, quite a few uh, with that one. <clears throat> and I got a Pacamara in here, so. Okay, I got a Catuai as well. I don't have Robusta, I don't have Bourbon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pacamara I do have, there is a Catura here, a Cafe Noventa from Honduras. We have a plant here, somebody, Lempira, we got one here too. Parinema, we got one here too. Parinema is a variety that uh, is resistant to nematodes and also has some tolerance to the rust. And it's become uh, lately one of the, the variety of choice in Honduras because it also has a good flavor profile. Ica too, I think we got one too. Uh, okay, coffee growing in the US, finally got here. There is a there is a company in in California called French, 
Uh, it started out as Goodland Organic. They, they incorporated into French and they've done a wonderful job of creating a buzz about California grown coffee. Uh, they've uh, started out with a former colleague, Mark Gaskell. I think he brought some seeds from El Salvador in the 90s, uh, early 90s, uh, then gave them to Jay Roski, who is the owner of Goodland Organics, now president, founder of French. And they started growing coffee, you know. And so Mark uh, and a few, you know, started talking about coffee. And I, I just dismissed, oh, it's not going to work. Ah, it's not going to work. And uh, but they kept plugging along. And um, over the years, Jay uh, convinced quite a few people <clears throat> in San Diego County and Southern California, really from Goleta, I think, where they are, Santa Barbara County, all the way down to San Diego, to start growing coffee commercially. And I kept dismissing them to the point that. We were getting enough questions, you know, from people in San Diego County. What about coffee? You know, is it working? And, uh, to the point that I was talking to our colleague, and you know what? We keep telling people that it won't work, but we really don't know. We haven't really done any research on it, to, you know, to, to see if it will actually work. So at that point, we, I think, 2015, 16, we started playing with coffee, uh, trying to grow plants. One of the biggest thing was uh, plant availability because they, they uh, plants. We're selling uh, at a significantly high price, you know, at about $25 a plant or so. And we uh, thought, hey, maybe we can learn how to grow these plants at a much lower price, right? And um, and so we started doing that. And also we wanted to see about the availability, I mean, the adaptability of the plants to different microclimates in San Diego. So first batch of plants, I think 2015 or 16, we gave them out to, to our master gardeners. And or some rare food growers as well got some of the plants, and we gave them out in sets of two plants for variety with the uh, to try them out, put them out in their location, whatever they were in San Diego, and then just kind of feedback information. To us. And we learn about you know how this variety is adapted. So even today it's kind of fun to hear from people. Hey, you know I still got that coffee plant you gave me, and it's now I got the beans, and it's kind of a fun to, to start a conversation. Last year, we uh, got really uh, zealous about it and germinated, uh, I mean, thousands of seeds of different varieties. So I donated, I believe, uh, gee, about 200, 400 seedlings of each variety to the CRFG in North County. And then I told them, if you can sell them, sell them, or may sell them for your scholarship fund. I mean, I even donated some to CRFG Modesto, you know, for the same purpose, you know. So I don't know if they're growing coffee in Modesto, but, but so we're trying to, we found out that it can be grown in from seed very easily. And it's, uh, and, and it can be grown at a much lower price than 25 bucks a plant. So what, what I tell growers today as a uh, same uh, approach that I did with dragon fruit, where I would tell people, hey, you know, I can give you five plants of each variety for you to play with and get the bug out. You know, try them out on your farm and see if they what variety adapts better. But I won't give you, you know, plants enough to start a farm. You know, you have to find another source after a while. But at least you get some familiarity with different varieties and what they, what they, how they adapt. One of the things that French did again created the buzz, created uh, some interest among growers. <clears throat> Although the growers that I can't help or assist are small scale growers. That don't have the financial capacity to play with French and, and the way that their coffee growing program, because they uh, they offer they sell you a packet you know with plants included, uh, technical assistance, and then they also market your coffee. So the growers that I that approach me, you know, don't have that level of uh, excuse me financial solvency excuse me, to get into a growing coffee in their program. So we, um, that's why we started this, uh, what we call the poor man's version of a coffee growing program in, in California. And, uh, and uh, I'm sorry? I already chased grass. How much did you that? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's what I'm talking about. So, <clears throat> they, uh, the, the establishment cost per acre, I think, uh, from what I've heard from Prince, is about sixty to seventy thousand dollars, and a lot of small scale growers don't have the capacity to do that. 
So we're trying to generate information that is publicly available. I tell people, you know, hey, your tax dollars at work. <laughs> and uh, and trying to make plans available, you know, in, in limited quantities for them to, to kind of play with, for, for farmers to play with. So we uh, started collaborating with Cal Poly Pomona in 2017. We did a trial at Cal Poly. Although we were, uh, I guess, the dean of the college didn't believe in the project, so they gave us the coldest spot on the campus. And when it was, uh, they took uh, taken out some lemons or whatever, yeah, put them here, you know, in the lowest part of the campus. I mean, lo and behold, what golfers didn't kill, winter just killed <laughs> So we lost the trial. Then we had a replicate uh, trial as an understory, again, largely unfunded as an understory crop to Chirimoyas at South Coast Field Station. Realized that Chirimoyas provide too much shade. The plants were fine, but they were like dormant. They didn't do anything. So at some point, Darren Haver, the director, said, yeah, Romero, come get your plants. We don't want them in the Chirimoyas. But people are kind of a tripping over them or whatever, and uh, so we'd rescue them. And I'll show you some of those plants in what I now call my coffee forest, you know, and, uh, and, and that I have in Irvine in a lot house. Yes, ma'am. Um, is it better to have a better Coffee plants? No, coffee is, it doesn't make a difference with coffee. I mean, it's so fertile, so pollinating for the most part. Yeah, one plant will produce your coffee. But I'll talk about some of the issues. So, yeah, coffee has great potential, both as a, as a well, as a commercial crop, the euro is still out. We don't know. There's a lot of work to be done to, 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 to make that plain. But it makes a wonderful house plant. I mean, beautiful foliage. Uh, you can grow them in pots. They do extremely well. I would say go with a 15-gallon pot. Some of our members have them that they just go by and off the berry and eat to give us yep. a little bit of a boost. Yeah, Stick totally. I was I usually I was joking with someone, hey, you know, maybe you can sell chocolate dip coffee cherries. You know, did you get a kick? I mean, it's kind of an acquired taste, you know, the the and different varieties will have different flavor and uh, different sweetness. And uh but yeah you can <clears throat> you can uh you can pop it in your mouth and uh, squeeze the juice inside of it and then get that mucilage up the beans and uh, I mean, that's what cybet cats do in, uh, in Southeast Asia, right? You heard of uh, the Kopiluak? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> there is a, a, a civet cat in Southeast Asia that eats coffee as part of their diet. So they, uh, they, uh, digest, they, eat, they digest the pulp, but expel the, uh, the beans in nice little cylinders of coffee, right? So people used to go out in the forest and harvest, you know, collect the, 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 the poop from these cats and then wash it and, uh, and, and process it and then sell it. And they used to sell in, uh, in, in Great Britain for $800 a pound. It's Kopiluak. The, the, the bad part about it is that people found out, so they started, instead of harvesting coffee, they would harvest the cats and put them in cages and then force feed them coffee. <laughs> And make him poop coffee all day. The challenge is that the lifespan of these cats diminished because that was a, a mono diet, and uh, and coffee was one of the uh, ingredients in their diet, but not necessarily everything. So uh, that created a, a human right, I mean, uh, animal rights uh, movement against Kopiluak coffee, but still, I mean, uh, uh, pretty pricey and a specialty, if you will. So very limited commercial coffee production. Uh, there are several success stories about people having a plant or two. I've seen them uh, from Costa Mesa, Paul Group, Vista, all over the place. And they get loaded with coffee. San Pasquale, San Pasquale Valley. We made a little much over there. Seems like a pretty good growing area. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know of anyone growing coffee in there. People growing with fringe are primarily Oceanside. Uh, Mike Milano at the flower fields, I think, has a very productive plot up there, probably about a half an acre. And they also have another piece in Oceanside, Temecula, a few guys in Valley Center. 
But usually coffee is an understory crop. I mean, they grow, but, but they don't, but the right shade of coffee is gonna be like at least six to 10 feet above the canopy of coffee. And uh, avocados, because the way we grow them, don't necessarily provide the right shade because they tend to grow low to the ground, right? So they grow them adjacent to it so that they intercept light. But, uh, but again, it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily a good shade tree for coffee which is kind of what the original intent was. Then they try to grow them in full sun here, but uh, that the plants get confused and uh, they, they just don't know what the heck to do. I mean, uh, they, they grow shoots when they should be blooming. So they get crowded. I mean, you get uh, the typical growth cycle for a plant is you get a single trunk going up, you get your laterals, that's where you get your coffee and you get your coffee and your year old branches. So you get those laterals out and the, the whatever is one year old at the time, once they reach maturity and then production keeps going up, right? Mm -hmm. In the newer shoots, you top them, then you start growing sublaterals and you get your coffee in the sublateral branches. But the way we see, and I have plants in full sun and I've seen it with other plants that are in full sun, you get these plants that are so crap Uh, it's all over the place. The plants get too confused with the, uh, they don't know how to grow properly, if you will. Does, does that cause more vegetative growth? Yeah. Less bean production. Pretty much, yeah. That is a challenge. And I mean, it just doesn't create the, it doesn't allow for enough light and, uh, air, you know, airflow and all those different things. So, so you get a chance for like shoot crops, like, like Alphysia and Ukraine yeah, but, but it is expensive to do in San Diego. So if somebody asked me today how to grow coffee, I would say, you know, put them under a shade. Create a 40% at least shade structure. If you're going to plant 500 plants, for example, put them on a compact type planting, you know, seven by three feet, you know, seven between rows, three feet between plants, under shade, and then you cater to them what they need, as opposed to spreading them out in uh, 500 plants over an acre, right? And then you tender to those plants, you cater for them, and I'll show you how they grow under shade in a lot house because the, there is significant difference between how they behave in a shade under shade, 50% shade versus in the field. So I think shade uh, makes a big difference in terms of. Well, potentially, we haven't gotten that far yet, but uh, to, to to do the comparison, yeah. Yep. And the other thing is that uh, the coffee, that uh, the, the ratio that I was telling you, five pounds of cherries to one pound of green coffee in the uh, coffee growing regions on average, here, I think that ratio is anywhere between 20 to 10 to 12 pounds of cherries. Uh, and and that's across the board. I mean, talking to Mike Milano, that, you know, how can we get rid of floats? I mean, a lot of uh, coffee cherries that are empty. I mean, so they they usually go out when you when you remove floats, and um, and, and a number of issues that can be uh, looked into. Primarily, nutrition may be one of it. Um, trying to get a more compact uh, season, bloom season with irrigation management, water management might be something to do some potential areas for research as, as we go into this. Varieties, we haven't really looked at whether some varieties have more floats than others. Uh, so a number of things that need to be evaluated in that regard. Propagation by seed, primarily. And uh, like I said, some tissue culture. Takes about 40 days for the seeds to germinate. And uh, then you just go out, pull out your, uh, at this stage on the far left, which is your the soldier stage, we call it, or, or match, to look like a, the, the, the little seedlings look like a match. You can just, you know, transplant them like that, or you let them open into the two cotyledons, the two leaves uh, that would come out. Um, Soil requirements, they like, well, oh, sir, were you taking a picture? Is this the one or you took it? Okay. Uh, well drained, slightly acidic soils, high organic matter. 
But, you know, I mean, sometimes there isn't much we can do about soil here in San Diego, right? So it is, you get what you get and uh, try to kind of work the soil uh, as best you can. And, and this is where having a plant that has a straight root system uh, is critical because you don't want anything that is like a corkscrew type root system or a bent root because uh, it will, uh, your plants will collapse. So for coffee, this is kind of borderline in terms of how tall the container is. You want them in taller container, but you don't want that tap root to be bent in any shape. If, this is what I was telling you about the root system and how long and straight it is. That's kind of what you want. Photo in the center, those are plants that should be discarded as, as, as not good for, for propagation, either any defect. If you're uh, in your seed bed, you want the finest particle possible because you don't want anything that will prevent that root from going straight down as it is on the left uh, photo here. And then you just kind of uh, put, put, press a hole into your pot and uh, make that root to go straight and uh, squeeze it a little bit and voila, you transplant your seedlings. In a few months, they'll start growing and you have your nursery plants. We're growing this in, in plastic liners. This is one liter liners. This is what I was telling you about my little coffee forest. Those are 15 gallon pots. Um, the plants have a single trunk, as I was telling you, they behave, uh, they are, and these are the plants I rescue. That's the other thing that they were not, uh, they were neglected initially. These are the ones that I rescued from my trial under the cherry moyas. I just pull them out and whatever I could save, I put in these uh, 15 gallon pots and that's the way they look. Uh, the photo on the right shows you uh, two, it's a Typica versus a Katwa E. And you can see the different plant structure where the Katwa E tends to be a shorter, uh, fuller plant. And typically for a house plant, I would go with those. And the typical plant on the right is kind of lanky, you know, taller, more spread. They don't look as full as the other. And also you can see the height. And I've already taught that typical plant at about one, at about six feet. Water requirements. They, coffee, surprisingly enough, is pretty drought tolerant. That they like water. They take, they use a lot of water but they, uh, they can sustain drought or, or limited amounts of water. You don't want to stress them for water though when the, when the, when the beans are filling, when the cherries are, are, you know, are being filled up. So for young plants, you know, more frequency than, than quantity is probably better. So a gallon a week um, and then go by feel. But I'll show you some photos of something that happened at, at my, uh, with my nursery plants in Irvine. The other thing is uh, coffee uh, water or rain, rainwater plays a huge part in terms of the seasonality of coffee. Like Honduras, for example, the western part of Honduras, <clears throat> which is where most coffee is grown, we don't get any rain from December to but April. I mean, occasional light rains. So you go to coffee farm, that's when the, the, the harvest season is. So they can dry them out as natural, you know, dry, patio drying coffee, it's quite common to see there, it's sun dried. And uh, you go to, to those, that region in March, April and go through by coffee farms. I mean, the trees look like this. I mean, it's like they are dead, you know, they don't drop the leaves, but they just look kind of droopy and uh, really they, uh, they've lost the, they look terrible. And then first rains in May, those plants come to life. And 15 days later or so, you, you, they just explode with flowers. So the, the, there is a guy from El Salvador that I was talking to about it. He said, you know, it's been quantified that coffee needs about 35 millimeters of water to trigger the onset of bloom. You know, the, 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 the crop has to receive like 35 millimeters of water, like, which is, a, what is it, about an inch change. Um, before, you know, to onset bloom. And that way they just explode, you know, and this kind of a very uniform bloom. And then nine months later, they, you just start, you know, you harvest your, uh, your coffee. 
So that's one of the things that we're trying, we will try to play with here, you know, whether to stress the water, I mean, the plants for water as they approach the, uh, the onset of bloom and then hit them with water. In uh, Hawaii, they argue that uh, sprinkle uh, that uh, water making contact with the buds also has a stimulating effect on the bloom that it stimulates the, the plants differently than just water them you know, with drip irrigation. So, so try to, to stress them for water, then just hit them with an overhead irrigation and maybe some uh, 35 millimeters or something to see if we can get a more compact bloom. <clears throat> but this is what I, I wanted to show you. Photos on the left, I, um, I had some plants in, in, sorry, this isn't lot house, may not be as, as clear, but, uh, but the picture on the left uh, shows, uh, I went to Honduras for a couple of weeks, uh, uh, Tony Pacheco, an assistant that helps at, uh, maintain things in Irvine, got really sick and didn't water the plants for 10, 12 days. So I get back and, uh, and I found him, the way they look on the left photos, and I say, oh my God, I lost them all. So I kind of, you know, typically what I do when I see things like these, I just say, I'll water them and walk away and see what happens. So I went back and uh, obviously the whatever was dry, dry. So I pulled out the plants that look more damaged and are the ones that you see on the ground in the second set of photos. Um, is, are they, dist can you distinguish that? Hardly, right? So the third set of photos is by, uh, they look dry. I kept watering them, but they look dead, right? I mean, they thought they were gonna go, they were all gone. And then I decided, okay, I'm gonna stop this and just to see what happened. So I cut them up about four inches off the ground and uh, my God, the stem was still alive. And I said, well, we'll see what happens. So they, they all started sprouting back after going through that. So today, one of you is going to be the crowd owner or a survivor. <laughs> this is what the planet So what looked totally dead, it's now coming back to life. I mean, and and uh, so they like water, but they can't withstand, uh, you know, some, some they, are, they have some drought tolerance because of the, uh, again, and this is in a container, it's kind of hard to assess, but in, in the ground, they have a deeper root system that allows them to, to kind of uh, pull water from, from down below. So in terms of uh, fertilizer, uh, I would say they like uh, potassium. So it's kind of a, the way we do it, I would say three, one, two is kind of what we go for. Three nit three parts nitrogen, one phosphorus, one then two potassium. If you know what I mean in an MPK type formula. So for every uh, yeah, three parts potassium, I mean nitrogen, one part phosphorus, and two parts potassium. Usually more potassium towards the uh, the, the fruiting season. Uh, any fertilizer, bottom bloom, uh, Type fertilizers will work, you know, for a house plant. And um, small amounts, you don't want to burn them. I've done that. I applied, and if you apply the fertilizer, make sure you don't apply it right next to the stem. Kind of uh, go around it, separate from the uh, little bit distance from the uh, from the base of the plant. Do they adapt well to foliar fertilization? Yeah, they respond pretty well. But I wouldn't, you know, use that as a substitute for for ground fertilizer. I mean, if you have them in pot, if you have a house plant, yeah, you can just kind of give them a shot of uh, diluted, you know, and you you want to keep that foliage green, yeah. Uh, flowers are small. I mean, it's amazing in my little coffee forest, and they're in full bloom. The jasmine scent that you can, I mean, it just smells great. And uh, people say you can pick, harvest the flowers and make tea out of it, but I don't know. That's kind of tedious. Although they, they're quite numerous, um, but yeah, you can you can use them that way. Wow, that's amazing! Ninety percent of the flowers pollinated by the Nandorosa. Yeah, uh, and uh, harvesting is done by hand. The uh, flowers on the right, the two lower, does the flower fields? They, we just happened to be there when they were harvesting. Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, uh, here in California, um, what, what is the, what, what are pickers pay per hour to harvest coffee? 
I, I would say is minimum wage, whatever that is. Uh, and I mean, and, and today is what, 15? Everybody knows what minimum wage is today? Yeah, 15 and change, right? I would say that would be the minimum. Uh, in the uh, coffee growing region, it is it's kind of a piece by a piece rate. You get paid by the uh, either a pound or by some sort of measure unit. Yeah, and I mean it's pretty labor intensive because, uh, like I said, the two photos on the right, on the lower right uh, are from uh, the flower fields, Mike Milano, and they do do a great harvest. I mean they select only ripe cherries, which is kind of what you want to produce to maximize the quality. But uh, you have to go several times through it. And, uh, and I mean, I don't know how good pickers are here, but in the in coffee regions, uh, they, they tend to be pretty good. I mean, about picking coffee and they can harvest. Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I've uh, seen guys harvesting 600 pounds of coffee on a day. Um, yeah. So it's it's uh, some people make good money harvesting coffee during the harvest season. So that's what coffee. Now we're talking about processing. The photo on the left is the natural processing. You dry the cherries as they come off the plant. This is what's called a drying method called African beds. This is the oldest processing method. This is what they started doing in Africa. And then because of uh, when it st we started growing coffee in Brazil and Latin America, we went to a wet processing where you run the coffee through a machine like the one in the upper right corner here, where you run the, 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 the coffee through a pulping machine that separates the pulp from the beans. So it's one side, the, the, the pulp comes out and the other comes the beans into a, into a tank, some sort of a tank or a container. And then you let that coffee, that mass of coffee with all the mucilage on ferment overnight. So you get uh, 12 to 18, maybe 24 hours, depending on how cold it is or what the weather conditions are. And then you, you know the coffee is ready to, to wash when you can. There are several ways to do this. I mean, but one is the, uh, the stick method. You stick a... Uh, push a stick in that mass, and when you pull it, the hole remains intact. When the coffee is fresh, it's really slimy and slippery, so you put something in there, and it just it falls back in. But with the, the one on the right, you make a hole with a, with a round stick, it stays the way it is, you know, like it is in the photo. Uh, in Colombia, they use what they call a uh, fur maestro, where they have a, like a cylinder, it's it's more of a like a funnel shaped thing, a conical pyramid shape. They fill it up to a, to the top, and once that coffee mass collapses and to a certain level, then uh, they say it's ready to wash. And by washing is you just kind of rinse it with water and remove that mucilage. The mucilage breaks down, and then you end up with parchment. But before that, the coffee that is coming out of the pulping machine, if you dry it with the with the mucilage on, that is what we call the honey processed coffee that we try. Sort of an intermediate between a washed and a natural coffee. So removing the pulp and the pectin layer then gives it a sweeter flavor. I'm yeah, sure. when you dry it with the pulp on, as it, the, the sherry, the whole cherry, you get a sweet kind of a fermented, in a good way, flavor like a wine, like a prune type taste to it. Very fruity, frutal taste. With the mucilage on, with the pectin on, you get a sweet coffee, but it's not as, as fermented as the one that you dry with the skin on. And when you dry it as a washed coffee, it's just the, 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 the flavor of the coffee itself. So, yeah. Oh. Uh, Pests and diseases, we really have, well, aphids and ants are the biggest problem we're seeing from a pest perspective here. And uh, and we just kind of got a couple of proposals to kind of look into that, uh, you know, because uh, they are being a problem both in the uh, in the nursery and also in the field. 
uh, but we don't have the rust, we don't have the coffee berry disease, we don't have any of these other diseases that are kind of uh, annihilating the industry worldwide, locally. Yeah. And uh, what we want to do with this, uh, again, develop, uh, we now have a trial at the flower fields with 15 varieties. And uh, if there is an interest at some point and you guys want to go see that, that trial, I'll be more than happy to, to, to take a group there. We have access to the facility and to see the plants. We also have a similar trial at Cal Poly Pomona with the same 15 varieties. And, uh, and we've also gave a few, I mean, the same set of varieties to uh, Whittier College up in Pomona as well for them to do some work related to, uh, to carbon sequestration and trying to look into how much carbon coffee plants pull off the ground, you know, and uh, to see, uh, to, you know, related to climate change and global warming and all that stuff, you know, environmental type research that they are doing. And yeah, so we have, uh, again, propagated a lot of plants. Uh, I brought these for raffle based on birthday or closest proximity to today's date. And I'll let you guys take care of that. I don't know how you want to do it. Um, and I forgot, I had some, I have a sample of a wash of these are washed honey and a natural. You can look at it. Honey seems to be the way to go. I'm sure that in the best flavor. I'm sorry. The honey seems to be the best way to go. I, I mean, in a place like San Diego, I would highly encourage it. I mean, because washing coffee can have an environmental not only negative impact. One is use of water, and two, uh, it's not so uh, even if you don't want nothing. Like wood or something where you can uh, get rid of uh, water to, to, to dry. I think with our weather, we can produce a honey coffee yeah. without it. Those are the taste test, right? Yeah. And it's one of the ones, uh, and it's one of the processing methods that provides uh, one of the better profiles. So yeah, I think uh, from an environmental perspective, from a cost perspective, it just makes sense to go with a honey type process coffee. So we want to continue developing information, you know, for, for people interested in growing coffee. We don't know whether this is going to become a, a kind of a sustainable industry. But we certainly hope so. I mean, uh, we think that married to act tourism, and if you get into into like coffee tasting and coffee cupping, uh, uh, somebody to, for for people, and then you get into the roasting and demonstration and all that educational component, I think and be it, it can work for some people. There's a lot of um, a lot of uh, demand. I mean, it's been Oh, totally. Yeah. And the other thing that I would say is that, you know, French kind of uh, emphasized the growing geisha as a variety, but I think that's a variety that, that if I were to advise someone, I would say don't grow geisha, capitalize on the localness of the coffee that is California grown as a, and go with a variety that is more productive, hardier. And, uh, and, and more vigorous than, than geisha. And that way you, you, you're, your fight is not as hard as. Okay. In the South Coast uh, garden, similar near where the uh, avocado garden is, uh, they do where they have the avocado repository in their time. Yeah, yeah, it is the same facility, <laughs> location, yeah. Yeah. We don't have a coffee trial there, though. I had a, I had a demonstration planting, but uh, the plants, most of them died. I neglected them equally. Yeah, yeah, no, she's uh, yeah, she's she's there with you, yeah, Danny and all those guys, and all those guys, they uh, they do a lot of work. Well, that's kind of the story we, we have with coffee, uh, the unfinished story, but um, yeah, looking forward to to more results. It's a challenge that even in the tropics, you know, countries to pay the workers for the farmers, but. 
local value? I mean, like uh, Jason Mraz, some of his companies sell three hundred a pound. Yeah, I mean, so like that's where you can make a Well, that's the challenge, though. It's how many gays, how many gays and Mirazes there are. You know, I mean, it's it's. Because it's kind of what I was telling you, I was telling someone, see, he was, uh, they did a cup in, I think, a Brew Rock roastery, uh, roasters, one of these, a uh, couple of years ago, and they were selling a, a little four ounce pack of uh, coffee for about a hundred bucks or something. And then as I told, but then I told some, yeah, but some people would pay a hundred dollars just to shake, uh, you know, Jay's with him, you know, <laughs> the coffee is out of the... <laughs> Yeah, and that, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about taking as much time, but uh, no. At some point, we'd like to do an exercise with uh, the single variety processed differently and have a more formal cupping type exercise because it's kind of fun to do this type of thing. So yeah, I'll I'll stop here and uh, thank you guys and sorry for. Taking so long. It's been fun. Well, yeah, I mean, in coffee itself, it's a commodity. I mean, it's uh, it's.